So today uh, we are going to um, finish topic five um, and maybe start on topic six. And um, what I forgot to do was get some uh, lab tip stuff. So let me just load that up for a second here. Give me a moment. Wanted to talk to you guys about labs a little bit every day until we get those lab reports handed in. So lab report tips, there's the file. All right, so there it is. Hold on a second. Just got to share the screen. Okay, sorry about the delay there. Uh, lab report tips. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit today about introduction methods and a couple of other things. So the introduction, uh, hopefully everybody knows this from your uh, lab, your first assignment. It should include the background information, the objectives, and your hypotheses. So do write this all in paragraph form, not one big long paragraph. You want to have multiple paragraphs. And uh, so a little bit about, uh, you know, membranes and deep roots and data sign in what the relevance of the pigment is, and then your hypotheses. So the methods section, uh, I do not want you to copy out the entire lab manual. Uh, there was like, I don't know, five pages of methods. I don't want that. I have that. I have a copy of that. Um, I'm good. Uh, but what I want you to do is make a very brief um, condensed summary of the, um, of the procedure. So one thing that you need to do as part of this is because uh, you're only giving a brief, uh, concise summary of the procedure is you're going to cite the, um, the actual lab manual. So your very first sentence should be, you know, something about how the complete detailed procedure is found in the biology 107 lab manual, and then you're going to cite it. So citation, we'll talk about citations next week. A citation is, is, it looks something like this. Well, this is where you have the author, and the year, and they're found in brackets. And, uh, and that's what you're looking at. Um, hopefully everyone's with me. Uh, Zoom just gave me a little bit of a glitch. I don't know what, uh, what the glitch meant. It gave me an error message. Hoping I am still connected to Zoom. Yeah, okay. Can I just get someone confirmed that you can still hear me? Hello? Can anyone hear me?
Uh, sir, we still can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear anything you're saying. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, yeah, somehow the mute went on, I guess when it connected and reconnected. <laughs> okay, so your, your methods, um, what we wanna see is uh, a concise summary and you want to have uh, the correct information, okay? Uh, so if you take a look at both of these examples, these were both written by students and uh, the one on top has much better information. Um, the one on the bottom, it doesn't really matter how you've prepared the beats. Um, I don't need that information. If I want that information, I will go to your, your source, which is the, the, uh, the lab name. What's important is you talk about uh, how the variables were controlled for. So we were um, measuring at different temperatures. Uh, the tubes were exposed for two minutes. Uh, that is sort of some key information. So you wanna to try to condense everything in about half a page and hopefully everyone um, uh, can do this. If you uh, want me to take a look at any samples of your writings, please let me know. Um, this kind of thing is not too bad, but it does take a little bit of practice to get good at it. So that's the introduction to methods. And there's one other thing that I wanted to address uh, regarding this lab. And uh, that of course is the, uh, the solvents. I've had a couple of people ask me about the solvents and what is going on there. So if you take a look at this here, uh, these are the solvents that we were using. So water, methanol, ethanol, and propanol. So what is going on here? Well, there is a trend. And it turns out that the trend is like this. Water is the most polar. I'm sorry. This is just a mess today. So water is the most polar. And notice as we go towards propanol, we are adding uh, more carbons and hydrogens. And if you remember in class, we talked about fatty acids and fatty acids, of course, are very nonpolar. And so as you go towards propanol, we get less polar. So this is the trend. So when you're talking about your hypothesis for the solvents and you're talking about uh, your observations in terms of what happened with the experiment, I want you to talk about polarity of the solvents, okay? Don't talk about acidity or anything like that. These solvents are not acids. Um, I can tell you all about acids, but that's, uh, that's not for this lab. All right, so sorry for all the interruptions there and, uh, and weird glitches. I'm going to uh, go back to um, talking about bacteria. And uh, like I said, if you have any issues or questions with the lab reports, please do send me um, what you have and I can always take a look at it. All right, back to bacteria. Okay. So last day we finished off and we were talking about glycocalyx and um, I think we kind of rushed through them at the very end. So glycocalyx, just to recap, are um, made out of carbohydrates. So glyco means carbohydrate or sugar and calyx means coat. So these are sugar coats. And I mentioned that there were two kinds, the capsules and the slime layers, and they were, um, um, the capsules are, are a little bit more um, tight and closer to the surface and the slime layers tend to be a little bit more loose and they actually break off and the slime layers actually absorb a little more moisture and so they become stickier and goopier. And so you can actually see this on the bacteria that grow with capsules and slime layers. Their, their actual colonies are goopier and stickier. And uh, so these things help with pathogenesis in that they help uh, to stick to cell surfaces. And uh, you can see in this case here, this here is actually a tonsil cell. And uh, we have the, uh, the organism is able to attach to the tonsil cell and cause, in this case, this is streptococcus, probably causing strep throat. Uh, these uh, capsules and slime layers also help these organisms evade the immune system and uh, because the immune cells can't attach very well because the things are kind of slimy. So I'll, I'll go to my notes in a second. There's a couple of more uh, notes to make. We did not quite finish talking about all the bacterial structures and there's two more that I wanted to talk about. One structure I want to talk about is something called a biofilm. And a biofilm is kind of related to a capsule and slime layer in that it's something that's secreted. And in fact, this is how many bacteria actually grow in the wild naturally in their environments. So what is a biofilm? Um, a lot of people call it a lot of different things. Some people call them microbial mats. Some people, people call them uh, slime. Um, and if you've ever uh, gone to the lake and you find a slimy rock, uh, that's basically a biofilm. So biofilm is technically 
the organisms that are living in there and all of their secretions. And their secretions can be carbohydrates and glycoproteins and sometimes other things as well. So there's a biofilm there. Uh, I'll give you another example of a biofilm. Uh, we all have a biofilm on our teeth and we have uh, microorganisms living there. And you probably know if you don't brush your teeth, it's not good for your dental health. And so that's the whole idea behind brushing and flossing, by the way, is just mechanically removing those, uh, those biofilms. And uh, if you had a choice between toothpaste and your toothbrush, um, then you want to go with the toothbrush because that is actually mechanically moving, removing the biofilm. And we never fully get rid of all of it because uh, there's just so many bacteria out there, but good dental practices is always a good thing. Okay, so just a reminder, we did start, uh, where is it? Uh, sorry, I just got to find the document. There it is. We did start this document last day and I finished off with glycocalyx. So I just have two more notes to make, one for biofilms and one for something called endospores. So I told you that biofilms were made out of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates and also glycoproteins. Of course, I can't spell again. What's wrong with me? All right, somebody said, oh no, not again. Hopefully they don't mean the internet connection is giving me problems. This is just wonderful. It makes me really unhappy. <laughs> um, I've been having uh, people doing repair at my house uh, and literally digging up the backyard. And um, so I don't know if that's part of it. Um, somebody's just saying it got a little choppy for a second. So hopefully we are reestablished here. Let me just try something here for a second and see if this helps the, uh, the signal. I have a couple of different Wi-Fi networks at my house. Okay, um, can I just uh, get someone to check to tell me if you can hear me again? I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I had, had somebody digging up my backyard um, in the back alley and, and um, it's been, the internet's been a little weird since then. Uh, so what is a biofilm that used? Um, this is a used for attachment to surfaces. To surfaces in the environment. So one thing about biofilm, I'm not gonna talk about biofilms a lot, but uh, often they're not just one organism, by the way, um, or uh, these organisms will, will live in communities. So you're looking at you know several species kind of living in these mats that you'd find on teeth or rocks or, or whatever. Okay, so one more structure I wanna talk about are the biofilms. So, um, it's going to do a review here, but I think I'm going to move on just so that we can actually finish everything in time. But um, maybe you can see all of the structures there. If you uh, upload the PowerPoint or download the PowerPoint, you can um, you can review all these structures. But I'm going to move on on this here. So let's talk about endospores. Um, so what is an endospore? Endospore is a um, it's a structure that some organisms can form. And it's only certain gram-positive organisms, and um, they they can form this. Um, so so what's happening is that uh, these these organisms end up um, something is bad. So there's no water, no food. Uh, the environment is changing and it's unfavorable. So what they're trying to do is protect themselves. So they take their DNA and they wrap it up with a big thick layer of uh, peptidoglycan, and uh, and then they just go dormant. So dormant means they're kind of like sleeping for a while. And uh, you can see some of those endospores right here. They, they can stain sometimes under, uh, under a microscope. So for example, over here on the left, you can see these blue things. Over here on the right, the endospores sort of look like little heads on little tennis rackets. I'll show you a better picture of two. Uh, if you were alive or around during 2001, um, you may, re may recall that uh, that is the year that we had the terrorist attacks that uh, hit the, uh, the two towers in New York. But another terrorist event that was also significant that fall was um, 
somebody had spent uh, had sent uh, endospores from anthrax in the mail. And um, these um, uh, quite a number of people got ill, mail carriers in particular, uh, unfortunately got really ill. Somebody's asking, are they formed only gram positives? Only certain gram positives, not all gram positives. Um, so only certain species like bacillus and anthracis, of course, is a representative of, of bacillus. So here's a picture. Like I said, is basically you take your DNA, you throw in some ribosomes, a little bit of ATP. Um, they actually make some chemicals that help preserve the DNA and then a huge thick layer of peptidoglycan, which we call the, the spore coat. I think I have a little picture showing the whole process here. And so you can see they're undergoing binary fission, but in this case here, it's an asymmetrical division. They don't divide equally. It's just protecting one copy of the genome. There's the spore coat there that's being formed. Like I said, that's just a thick layer of peptidoglycan. And, uh, and then eventually, eventually you get your, uh, your endospore. And uh, some endospores get released from the rest of the cell. Some of them, some of them remain around. And, and then it just sits there and can sit there for a long time, waiting until um, what, was, uh, what was sent, uh, uh, waiting for um, nutrients or moisture or whatever it is that they're lacking. Uh, so somebody is asking here, anthrax endospores were sent to people. Yes, uh, this was a terrorist event that happened in 2001. You can look it up on the internet. Um, they think they know the guy who had done it. Uh, he um, had, um, it was being investigated and committed suicide. So he was the primary suspect, but they, they think they know quite a bit about it now in terms of what was happening. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty, like, that's like pretty significant. That's kind of a worse nightmare if you're thinking about uh, uh, bioterrorism or something like that. So one, one thing about these endospores is they're very, very durable. So they can survive the mail. They can survive uh, sitting around in a lab for a while and they can actually survive for a long time. Um, how tough are these things? So it turns out that we, uh, uh, 67 years after Louis Pasteur's death, they found a closet full of his stuff and they were able to revive bacterial endospores from that. So these things can last 50 years easily. And, uh, and, and they can last in the soil, they can last in vials, and there's other places that uh, we think we've revived endospores from. Um, for example, Egyptian mummies, uh, 3,000 years. And uh, so Egyptian mummies, of course, are dried and desiccated corpses with um, uh, chemicals to preserve them, and so the endospores can actually survive quite well in, uh, in, the, in the guts. Um, there's been a few other studies where people have claimed to have uh, revived endospores. So you may know, uh, know that they can do these uh, ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica that can actually go back a long, long uh, time in, uh, in history. So Antarctica, apparently 8 million years. And um, people have also claimed to have found endospores in bees and amber. Um, there's a little bit of debate about these ones because some people believe uh, DNA can actually only last maybe 50 or 100,000 years. Um, but of course, these are endospores. They have special chemicals and preservatives in there as well. And uh, so it, it is all possible. Uh, you may uh, look at this bee and uh, in amber thing, and it may remind you of a movie or a book called Jurassic Park. And so Michael Crichton actually got the idea for Jurassic Park um, from this scientific study where somebody was trying to revive endospores from um, insects that were found in amber. And of course, Michael Crichton was like, wow, what if there was dinosaur DNA in there? And so that was kind of his little spark of inspiration for a Jurassic Park. So it kind of makes an interesting story. Okay, so let's just make a quick note of endospores. And, um, and then we have a few other things to talk about with bacteria. So what are endospores? Endospores are basically a thick layer of peptidoglycan and a few other things, but I think that's um, peptidoglycan. That's kind of the, the gist of it. And so these are dormant structures and uh, they allow the organism to survive, uh, we'll say harsh conditions. So they can, they can sit there. So somebody's asking, is this part of the plan to clone mammoths? Um, great question. Um, no, actually, uh, mammoths, um, we're going we're to talk about this way at the end of the course, just kind of an interesting little thing. But uh, mammoths are actually recent enough 
um, that we have found um, we have found remains of mammoths with actual tissue, blood, and things like that. And so that, it can actually get DNA from that, uh, blood and hair and whatnot. And so worth talking about a little bit later on in the semester. But great question. Okay, so there's a lot that we can say about bacteria. Um, a few things I want to talk about that are just kind of related to next week's lab. We're going to be doing some gram stains and uh, we're going to look at these things and we're going to see that they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. So here's some shapes and some words for you to know. We've already mentioned uh, the word caucus or cocci. That means spher spherically shaped cells. Um, some cells are also rod shaped. The scientific term for that is uh, bacillus. Bacilli is is uh, is many, so this is plural versus versus singular, and you can also have a um, corkscrew or a spiral shape, and they're called spirilli or spirillum shaped organisms. So if you have pairs, you get diplo, and so for example, you might have diplococci. In that case, what you can see there is, uh, and so you've got little uh, two cells like that. Clusters are staphylo, so we we talked about staphylo already. So Staphylo, you're getting clusters, and sometimes I think they look like little bunches of grapes, so maybe something like that. And then chains are strepto. So if you've ever heard of streptococcus and causes strep throat, that is the organism we're talking about. So those are just some words for you guys to know because you're gonna to need to know them uh, in the lab and um, they're gonna be important maybe for the lab exam as well. And so just a little heads up on that. So I just want to talk about kind of um, a few bacteria in particular. Uh, mainly, I want to talk a little bit about E. coli. Uh, there are many groups of bacteria. You can see um, here's uh, uh, the proteobacteria. And the proteobacteria are uh, a major group of bacteria. These are gram negatives. And so E. coli falls into this group. And I can't remember E. coli is either, uh, I think it's a beta proteobacteria, if I remember correctly. And uh, many of the bacteria that you've, you've maybe heard of out there uh, do belong into these groups, the gram negatives anyway. So salmonella you may have heard of, there's photosynthetic bacteria in this group as well, and, uh, and all sorts of other things. Um, there are many other groups, there's the gram positives, there's spirocretes, uh, cyanobacteria. If you take other, uh, if you take microbiology courses, you'll learn quite a bit about these uh, particular organisms. Um, maybe you've heard of the chlamydias, they cause the sexually transmitted infection, chlamydia. Um, so many, many types, um, huge amount of variety of prokaryotes out there in the environment. So let's talk a little bit about E. coli. Um, so E. coli, um, Escherichia, by the way, stands for uh, Theodore Escherich. That's the guy who discovered it. And coli is basically short for colon because that's where it lives in your intestines. And uh, you can see that uh, E. coli here is a... Um, uh, a rod shaped, so it's a bacillus organism. It has lots of flagella. And um, here's some pictures of it. You can see sometimes it doesn't have flagella. Uh, there are a few E. coli out there that uh, are, are particularly nasty, um, but for the most part, it's mostly harmless. In fact, it is a mutualistic relationship that it lives with us, lives in our gut. So I think I have some pictures here I wanna share with you. Uh, a lot of people think of E. coli like this. I'm thinking about contaminated hamburgers or contaminated uh, romaine lettuce or something like that. And uh, this is how scientists often think of E. coli because it is a really useful organism and uh, we grow it in the labs all the time. It's great for genetics experiments and all sorts of biotechnology applications and whatnot. And I'll, I'll show you an application here in a moment. So what is E. coli? It's an organism that lives in your intestine. And uh, I had mentioned before that it is mutualistic. So we feed it food and we give it moisture and habitat. And it uh, does things like help digest our food. It provides vitamin K. And it's actually only a small part of the population of the bacteria that's found in our gut. So about 0.1%. So I know some people are looking at this and they're doing the math, right? You're thinking 0.1% and, and you're thinking about, um, um, you know, all the bowel movements on the planet. And um, here's kind of the number, right? Uh, every day, the world's population releases more than a billion trillion E. coli into the environment. <laughs> so quite a bit out there. So for the most part, this is a happy existence, us and E. coli. Sometimes though, it does cause us some issues. 
And uh, kind of to explain this, I wanted to show you that there's many, many strains of E. coli. So most strains actually fall into this category. They're non-pathogenic, meaning they're not usually going to cause any illness in us. Um, and um, yeah, and so we grow them in the lab. Uh, they live in us, and, and they do all sorts of other things. Uh, some fall into the pathogenic category, and this is the type that you hear about in the news, where somebody went traveling and they got E. coli, or there's E. coli, uh, you know, in your contaminated Brussels sprouts, or or, or whatever it is. And uh, so there are some uh, pathogenic versions, and usually these are causing some sort of diarrhea, or in some cases a bloody diarrhea, and um, and then there are some organisms that fall kind of into this gray zone category where they're potentially pathogenic. So that means if they're in their gut, in your gut, they're not usually causing any issues. But if they end up in the wrong part of the body, um, let's say they end up in your bladder. Now you could have a bladder infection. Or if you get it in your blood, you could end up with a blood infection. So some, some strains fall into this category where uh, they're potentially pathogenic, but not normally. So lots of E. coli out there. I'm not really going to go into all the, all the nuances and details here, but just worth knowing that it's mostly harmless, but sometimes causes disease. It's not all bad. Uh, like I said, geneticists and people who work in labs, they think about E. coli a lot because we use it all the time. And it's very useful in biotechnology. Um, a classic example is the production of human insulin. And this was done for the first time in 1982. So this is quite some time ago. but you probably know that insulin is taken by people with diabetes. And so this means before 1982, how did diabetics get insulin? Uh, we had to slaughter animals and we had to uh, take the insulin from their, from their pancreases. Um, the animals didn't like this. Um, the humans sometimes had adverse side effects because they're not getting human insulin. So scientists eventually like, well, why don't we just use E. coli to make human insulin? So how is this done? So what you can do is you can take your human cell and you can, um, you can take the DNA, the gene for insulin. And we can get a bacterial plasmid. So there's E. coli, and we've talked about plasmids as these little rings of DNA. And we can actually basically put these things together. This is called genetic engineering or recombinant DNA, has a few other names. So now what you have is the gene for human insulin inside a bacterial plasmid. You can take that bacterial plasma and put it back into E. coli. And then E. coli is just going to use its machinery, its ribosomes and all those kind of things. And it's going to take that and basically produce that protein. And this protein in this case is human insulin. We can um, extract the, uh, the protein from the fermentation tank. And, uh, and there we go. So there's one of the human insulins on the market. It's called Humulin. And so now we have a cheap alternative to slaughtering animals. And the animals are a lot happier, and we actually have human insulin. So the um, uh, people don't have as many reactions to, to this as they would uh, uh, to animal insulin. So this, is, this has been done thousands of times with all sorts of different products and genes. I did something like this in my own research. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, people like E. coli is just a great thing for. Um, uh, uh, for copying genes and uh, producing gene products. Okay, a um, couple other things about bacteria. Uh, something that we're hearing about a lot nowadays is people are talking about the microbiome. And it uh, turns out that, uh, that bacteria have a lot of aspects of, uh, they affect a lot of aspects of human health, a lot of it in a positive way. And, uh, we're starting to talk about the microbiome now as being kind of like a, an organ in and on your body. Uh, so what is the microbiome? The microbiome is, is all the organisms that live on you and in you. So many of them are in your gut. Uh, in fact, the majority of them are in your gut, but they're also found on your skin. They're found uh, up your nose, um, in your sexual organs, uh, um, all sorts of places all over your body. And uh, they can, depending how recently you've taken a bowel movement, they can weigh up to three kilograms and, and doing all sorts of things. Um, some of them are protecting us against pathogens. Some of them are helping us digest things. Uh, they have a big part in, um, in uh, organizing and uh, helping your immune system develop. Um, some of them are making neurotransmitters and probably affecting our mental health. 
And there's a lot that we don't really understand, but this is, uh, like I said, this is something that uh, modern medicine is really starting to take more seriously. So you're going you're gonna to hear a lot more about the microbiome uh, in the years to come, uh, for sure, as people start to learn a little bit more about uh, how these organisms are affecting our health. So worth mentioning here, probably could give a whole lecture on it, but I'm not going to do that today. So the big thing about bacterial organisms that we're very interested in, of course, is that many of them are pathogens. So we talked a little bit about anthrax already. I had mentioned that they were killing bison and uh, other, other uh, livestock. And uh, anthrax can form endospores. And uh, a lot of these animals, like bison, they, uh, they eat uh, grass. And if they inhale endospores in the lungs, it can be a fatal disease. Uh, humans sometimes get anthrax, not usually inhalation anthrax. Um, it was super unfortunate for those mail carriers um, years ago. Um, but uh, humans, particularly people who are interacting with animals, so farmers, sometimes get cutaneous anthrax. That means in the skin. And it forms these, um, these lesions that are kind of characteristically black in nature. So kind of, kind of ugly. So this, this is one bacterial pathogen, and there are many. Uh, here's inhalation anthrax, by the way. You can see somebody has an abnormal uh, chest x-ray and causing some issues. And there, of course, is the bison picture I showed you way back in, uh, I think it was topic one. So like I said, there are many bacterial pathogens out there, some of them very serious, uh, tuberculosis, flesh-eating disease, some very treatable. Uh, we all end up with bacterial infections at some point in our life. Um, many of them are thankfully treatable nowadays due to antibiotics. And uh, that's the last part of this unit I want to talk about, just a little bit about um, antibiotics and drugs. So, um, oh, before I talk about that, I just wanted to make a, a define um, one type of organism, something also that they talk about in the news a lot are superbugs. So what is a superbug? Superbug is an organism that is resistant to uh, many different types of treatment. Um, not just one, but often they're resistant to multiple types of treatment. And um, one of the superbugs that we talk about a lot is this one here, MRSA. Some people call it MRSA. Um, this is multiple drug resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or sometimes called methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So if you ever hear about anyone talking about superbugs, this is the one that they're usually talking about. If you're ever in the hospital and you see a sign on a door, that it might say something about uh, this person has a superbug or MRSA or something like that. They need to take it very seriously because uh, this can spread through patient to patient and it's hard to treat. Um, staphylococcus, uh, like most staphylococcus, is typically a skin organism. But this one here, if it gets into other tissues, it can get into bladders and blood and lungs and things like that. It can cause a very, very serious disease. And when it's uh, resistant to treatments, uh, that's obviously a very dangerous situation to, to have. So back to these bacterial structures. Like I said, I want to talk about antibiotics for a minute or two here. I meant to put that superbug slide at the very end. Um, we've talked about these, um, these different components of the bacterial cells and uh, kind of talked about, uh, we made our notes and you know, what were these things made of, right? So plasma membrane, for example, is made of PL, that's phospholipids, by the way, and proteins. DNA is made of nucleotides, uh, glycocalyx or carbohydrates, and, and so on. So a lot of these things are important because they are uh, essential for pathogenesis, meaning that they're essential for these organisms uh, to be able to cause disease. So like the glycocalyx and the pili help these organisms to attach to human uh, tissues. And of course that allows the organisms to, um, uh, to be pathogenic and so on. Uh, some of these other um, cellular components are actually important for uh, our drugs and our treatments. And that's what I want to talk about here for a couple of minutes. So let's talk about antibiotics and what are they and what do they do? So antibiotics are drugs, chemicals that uh, um, the whole idea is to kill the pathogen, kill the bacteria and not harm the human. So there's a whole bunch of them out there. Maybe you recognize some of these names. Some of the more common ones out there are, are the uh, penicillins, so penicillins over here, and uh, the tetracyclines. Um, I'm just trying to think what else is relatively common, the fluoroquinolones. Um, 
the polymixins. These are all, all things that you may have had a prescription for at some point in your life. And um, I'm very likely um, most of us have had prescriptions for some sort of penicillin. So these drugs, uh, like I said, the whole idea is it's, it's kind of like a magic bullet, you know, killing specifically the pathogen and not harming the human cell. Now, of course, some of them have side effects and whatnot, and uh, uh, we can't get into all that today. But so what is, what is the whole idea here? So the whole idea is we want to target a structure that is unique to the bacteria. So the big one you can see here is actually the peptidoglycan, the cell wall. So remember that humans, our cells do not have cell walls. We do not have peptidoglycan. So if we can mess around with peptidoglycan synthesis, then we can kill the bacteria. There are other drug targets. Uh, for example, the ribosomes. Remember, we talked about how ribosomes in, in bacteria are different than ribosomes in eukaryotes. So if we can affect the ribosomes, we can also affect the bacteria. And there are other structures out there. You can see DNA replication in the membranes, and things like that. But I'm not going to get into all those details there. Uh, the one I want to talk about, though, is this one here, uh, penicillin. Because penicillin inhibits peptidoglycan biosynthesis. And like I said, that's a great target because human cells do not have peptidoglycan. So let's talk a little bit about how penicillins work. Um, so here's your cell, right? It's got a cell wall made of peptidoglycan. And uh, what happens is uh, when it grows, um, it needs to make space. So it's kind of like imagine if, I was, if you were to renovate your house and you need to expand a wall. Um, you know, you have to maybe break down some of the drywall in order to add in new material. And it's kind of like that with peptidoglycan is that they have to actually make some holes. And then in a normal growing cell, they're gonna fill it in with new material and then eventually the cell's gonna divide. So in a, a cell that is inhibited by peptidoglycan, they start um, stretching out, the penicillin is in there, it uh, interferes with the enzymes that are involved in the synthesis and the cell basically kind of, well, it breaks open, that kind of thing. So a little animation, I thought that was cute. I thought you might like it. So that's basically how penicillin works. Um, you should know for this class that it interferes with peptidoglycan biosynthesis. Um, if you want more details, I can tell you all about it. Uh, one other thing to note about penicillin is that there's a whole bunch of them. You can notice I'm calling them penicillins. There's all sorts of penicillin drugs out there. They're also known as beta-lactams. That's an organic chemistry term. And you can see uh, from this diagram here, they all have um, this uh, special little square ring structure with uh, a nitrogen in it. And uh, that's called a beta-lactam ring. So there's a whole bunch of different um, types of these drugs. Some of them are effective against gram positive. Some are effective against gram negatives. Some of them you can take orally. So you can take them as a pill. Some of them you have to inject. And, uh, and, and that's part of the prescription process uh, where a, um, a prescribing doctor, of course, is trying to figure out uh, you know, what would be the best treatment for, um, for the infection that you might have. Okay, so this is my last slide for talking about bacteria. And um, you're probably wondering what it is, or maybe people are looking at it and saying, hey, I know what that is, it's E. coli. And uh, you can see the pili. So we've got some pili here. And uh, this is probably the chromosome. That's probably a plasmid. We have some ribosomes and other structures. Uh, what you probably don't know what it is, is actually this is somebody I know. Um, she was E. coli for Halloween. So she bought a bunch of glow sticks and made this costume. Um, you can't really see her face, but it's kind of in there somewhere. And I uh, thought I'd share that with you because, hey, Halloween's coming up and I know some people are looking for costume ideas. All right, time check. It is 10 to five. I am going to uh, start a little bit and talk about topic six. So let me just load that up here. Uh, what did it do with the PowerPoint? The topic six, I have it here somewhere. There it is. I have too many documents open up today, unfortunately. Usually I close everything down when I'm trying to do this Zoom thing, but it is what it is. All right, one more second here, and that should share with you right now. So topic six, we're going to be talking about eukaryotes, and we're going to be talking about organelles and what all of these things do. And uh, most of that will be maybe next day. 
Um, so this is actually the last topic we're going to cover before the midterm. Um, so this will take uh, probably two lectures next week, and then Friday will probably be reviewed. That's kind of the plan. And I'm trying to remember the date of the midterm. Is the midterm the following Monday? I, I can't, I don't have the course outline in front of me, but it might be the following Monday. So we will have some time for uh, review before we get to the midterm. So somebody is saying that's on the 13th. It's a Wednesday. Okay, well, well that's even better. Um, it's probably the Wednesday because maybe is Thanksgiving in there somewhere? Yes, it is. Okay. The following Monday would be Thanksgiving. So I'm not going to give you the, uh, the midterm on Thanksgiving. It will be after Thanksgiving on a Wednesday. So we will have time for review uh, next week and hopefully lots of time to prepare for the midterm. So uh, do, do um, attend those lectures. Uh, I'll try to make them uh, useful for preparing you for the midterm. All right, so here we go, way back to this. This is kind of a theme of the course, by the way, eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. Uh, you know, the differences uh, in terms of their biology and their cellular structures and those kind of things. And, and, and most of the semester, we're going to come back to this. We're going to talk about and say things like, well, this is how eukaryotes do this, and this is what prokaryotes do, and so on. So there they are. Um, the eukaryote is on the left. It's got the nucleus. It's bigger. And this particular eukaryote is, uh, is actually a white blood cell, and you can see it's uh, it's very aggressively attacking those bacterial invaders. So um, we produced um, a chart uh, like this. And uh, hopefully you got all that information. If you missed it, there it is now. And uh, you can see uh, on the left-hand side, I think we've covered everything there over on the left. Um, we talked about the flagella. We talked about uh, some of the structures, the back of the cell walls and all those kind of things. Uh, on the right, um, some of these things uh, we're going to talk about in this unit, and some of these things are going to be later units. For example, we're not really going to talk about flagella in eukaryotes until topic seven, because um, it kind of fits in better to topic seven. But uh, anyway, just a reminder of some of the things that we have been talking about, and some of the things that we will be talking about. So there's our kind of our pictures, and you see these in textbooks everywhere. They kind of want to show you your typical animal cell and your typical plant cell compared to your typical prokaryotic cell. And um, the, these pictures are, are never perfect. And uh, what I wanna do is kind of come back at the end of this unit and talk about animal cells versus plant cells versus fungal cells and kind of to recap that. But let's just talk about some of the uh, organelles and whatnot in, in general. So first place to start is the cytoplasm. We already talked about the cytoplasm of E. coli and I told you that it is not just liquid. It's actually full of enzymes, it's full of, um, uh, RNA, it's full of something called a cytoskeleton, and we're going to get to that uh, in topic seven. So that'll be after the midterm, of course. There's the cytoskeleton there. Yay. Um, like I said, I love these pictures that show you uh, that the cytoplasm is not empty. It's full of all sorts of uh, really interesting stuff. So the first place I want to talk about today, and probably today I only get to talk about the nucleus, is the endo membrane system. So what is the endomembrane system? Endo means inside and uh, membrane means membrane, right? So these, this means all the membranes inside of the cell. And when we talk about the endomembrane system, we're actually referring to uh, organelles that are either connected physically or connected through something called vesicles. So this does not include the mitochondria and chloroplasts, and we'll come back to mitochondria and chloroplasts next day. And so you can see this includes the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi body, vesicles, lysosomes, peroxisomes, and, and a few other things. There's another image of the endomembrane system. This one is from a plant cell. Uh, I kind of like this one better because the, um, the scale is, is a lot more accurate. You can notice like the Golgi body is that tiny little thing over here. And uh, you can see it's got this giant um, central vacuole right here. And so this is where, if this was a, um, a beetroot, this is where your, your pigment, your beta cyanin would be found. And there's a few other things in there that are kind of unique to plants, like oil bodies and things like that. So let's talk about the nucleus, and that will be where we're going to finish today. Um, so you probably know that this is where the DNA is found. And uh, in a eukaryotic cell, uh, this can be pretty big, depending on the kind of cell, roughly 10 to 20 percent of the cell volume. Um, Plant cells and animal cells can be very different in terms of their actual size. And uh, it's also connected to the endoplasmic reticulum, which we'll, we'll get to next day. 
So there's a picture of our, our nucleus and the DNA inside. You probably know sometimes we don't just call it DNA, we call it chromatin or chromosomes. So I think, do I have a definition there? Yes, there we go. So what, did, what do we mean by chromatin? Um, chromatin is basically the DNA and associated proteins. And a big chunk of these proteins are something called histone proteins. So you can sort of see the histone proteins right here in this diagram. And uh, what they are is these little proteins and the DNA literally spools around it. So they help to coil the DNA so that it doesn't get all tangled. We're gonna talk more about histone proteins uh, when we get to topic um, 10, I believe it is, or sort of 12, I think, uh, in terms of DNA packaging, but it's worth knowing that they're part of the packaging process. And so when we say chromosome or chromatin, uh, we don't just mean the DNA, we mean the associated packaging proteins as part of that whole uh, system. So um, one other thing in the nucleus is something called the nucleolus. So the nucleolus is uh, where ribosomes are put together. And uh, so ribosomes are made out of RNA, a ribosomal RNA, that's what the little R there is for, and they're made out of proteins. So what you're seeing, uh, they actually stain really well. And uh, it's possible on that picture on the left that there's two nucleoluses there. There's one there and the big one in the middle. If this is a plant cell, plant cells very typically have many uh, nucleoluses. Uh, animal cells usually have one or two. And um, it's, it stains really well. And this is because it's just loaded with RNA, ribosomal RNA, and the ribosomal RNA stains really well. So we'll talk a little bit about later on this semester how these ribosomes are assembled when we talk more about ribosomes. So something else to know about a nucleus is that it's got a membrane. And so um, this membrane here, if you take a look, um, is actually a double membrane. I'm looking at this picture here in the middle and um, it sort of folds in on itself. And uh, I'm not really sure why it needs to fold in on itself. I didn't design the nuclear membrane myself. Um, but uh, that's what it does. And a part of this membrane are these things here, these big protein complexes called nuclear pores. So what is a nuclear pore? Nuclear pore is an entranceway. It allows things in and allows things out of the nucleus. So that's good. We need to get things in and out. There's some pictures of nuclear pores and uh, they stain really nicely and those proteins show up really well. So I just want to talk a little bit about what's going in and what's going out. Um, this, is a, this is a good question. Um, and I usually um, you know, sp spend a little bit of time talking about this in class uh, and getting people's input on this, but I'm just gonna give you the answers now. But think about it, what needs to go in uh, to the nucleus? So anything needing to go into the nucleus are things like components for, my pen's not working. Let's try that, there we go. So what needs to go in? So we're, we're making DNA in the, in the nucleus. So we need nucleotides to go in. Uh, any proteins, proteins are made out um, outside of the nucleus and ribosomes. So any proteins, including enzymes for DNA, uh, for DNA uh, processes. So enzymes for replication and whatnot. Um, histone proteins, I guess I meant to say histone right there. Histone proteins, anything like that. So what's made in the nucleus? DNA is made in the nucleus. Uh, DNA does not leave the nucleus. But RNA is also made in the nucleus and RNA has to get out. So the big type of RNA that people often think of as messenger RNA, but also transfer RNA is something else that is made uh, in the nucleus. Um, there are other things that are coming in and out. I guess the last other thing to mention is the ribosomal subunits. So ribosomes. So usually I have a bit more of a discussion on this, but we're going to talk about a lot of these things a little bit later on. Uh, the DNA doesn't move. It stays in the nucleus the whole time, with one exception. Uh, when we do mitosis or meiosis, and that's when uh, the DNA is going to not stay in the nucleus anymore. So more on mitosis and meiosis in topic uh, 12. So one more thing to say about the nucleus before I let you go is it is a very large organelle. And when you have a very large amount of membrane, um, usually you have to uh, stabilize it somehow. And so um, the last thing to mention about the nucleus is there's this stuff here, it's called the nuclear lamina. And these are filaments 
and they line the inside of the mucus. And so they give it, uh, give it its big structure and allow the membranes to, to be relatively stable. Uh, we're gonna talk about nuclear lamina again a little bit later on in topic seven. Um, like I said just previously a minute ago, it's worth it to know that nuclear lamina is kind of a permanent structure with the exception of during mitosis and meiosis when the chromosomes are trying to move around and then the nuclear lamina actually uh, gets dissolved and, and removed. All right, so it looks like uh, we're out of time for today. So thanks for coming and thank you for bearing with me with the, uh, the technical glitches today. Um, Monday, we're back uh, on campus. So it'll be good to have that. I know that I'm much better a lecturer in person than I am on Zoom. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all again and getting back to, you know, um, we're all hoping for something normal. So let's, let's hope this all works out uh, for the best for everybody. Uh, have a great weekend and I'll see everybody on Monday.